So in part one, I discussed how the key to negotiating win-win solutions is quite simply understanding and empathy. And we talked in part one about how to get more understanding of yourself, the other person, and the situation. Well, now in part two, we're going to discuss the empathizing part, which I know some of you think, I've already, I'm already doing that. I'm a natural empath. Okay, yes, I'm with you on this. But hey, we've been doing it wrong. <laughs> so let's talk about that. Let's talk about doing it right. Okay, because to negotiate well, you must empathize well. And that involves you empathizing with yourself and getting others to sincerely empathize with your situation. Uh-huh, yeah. So first, Sympathize with them, which if you're a natural empath, you should be able to do this pretty well. Um, but when you do this, you are demonstrating you understand their world, their cares, their concerns. And you've listened to them. You've let them vent in some cases and maybe even until they wear out. Okay, you, And then when they're done, you say, it seems like you're concerned about, fill in the blank, mirror back to them what they said, or... It sounds like fill in the blank is really important to you. Do this, keep mirroring back until they say something like, that's right, and they feel heard. And when that's said, the negotiation starts. Do not start negotiating until you have demonstrated you understand them and they affirm that yes, you do. You got it. That's exactly how I feel. Now, step two is now that they agree that you understand their point of view, you get them to understand yours. Ask open-ended questions. And I know this is really hard advice. We have to retrain ourselves as empaths not to be the fixers, the experts, the know-it-alls, because, you know, the, the healers, that's what we try to do, come and fix it, you know, and this is where narcs sit back and let you do it. Yeah, we know how that goes. It doesn't end well. So instead, what you do is you ask open-ended questions, empathize with their situation to make them feel heard, as I said earlier, and then follow it up with comments like, but how am I supposed to do that? Right, you're not solving, you're getting them to solve. You're having them put themselves in your shoes. But how am I supposed to do that? Or they'll either come up with a creative solution so both of you get what you value, or raise or lower their initial request to accommodate you, or tell you that they can't or won't, and if that's the case, walk away. If they raise or lower their initial offer, but come back with one that does not meet your needs, come back with another open-ended question, such as, that's very generous of you, but I don't see how I'm supposed to do that when dot, dot, dot. (laughs) Fill in the blank. What is holding you back from doing what it is that they want you to do? Or you could say something like, well, you know, this is all I can do and keep it very simple. But notice that with that, you're, you're really maintaining boundaries because if you're firm on, hey, you know, you're asking me to do something that is beyond my limits, well, you're maintaining boundaries by saying, well, this is all that I can do for you. And again, you leave it to them. You put the ball in their court to decide if they're going to try to fix it or how they might be able to fix it because you're not coming in to do the fixing for them. If money is part of the negotiation, do your research, figure out what's fair, and then, yeah, maybe offer something for 10% less while advocating for what you need. That might be a way to get some bargaining there, some leverage in terms of, again, it's like an exchange. You want something, they want something. Okay, well, I'll give you 10% off, but I'm going to need this over here. Mind you, with every increase thing that they're asking of you, make sure that you're balancing the scales. As you're giving to them, what are they giving to you? And vice versa. In summary, to empathize well, you've got to get to a place in your conversation where you you get agreement because that person feels that they have been heard and understood and they're saying something to the effect of, that's right, that is exactly how I feel. That is exactly what I need and I want and I value. And second, you ask them to help you solve your problems with open-ended questions that invite them to be the fixer, 
the solver, the healer, by saying, how am I supposed to do that? Now, some people call this approach tactical empathy. And realize, I've noticed that a lot of narcissists actually do this. This is exactly what they do. Unfortunately, they're doing it for egotistical reasons by mirroring or faking shared values. And I mean, to some degree, it's, it's a good strategy and it works, it's effective. But of course, you know, I'm not encouraging anybody to do this for egotistical reasons or, you know, lying about things to manipulate to get what you want. This is really to be practiced, I believe, from a place of authenticity and altruism as much as possible. If you're asking a narc to empathize and they don't, which is not going to be a big surprise, right? Or if you're asking a narc to meet you halfway and they don't, you know, don't consider it a failure on your part, but rather a success at identifying bad alliances and partnerships to avoid in the future. This is all very key to intel gathering that I talked about earlier with the, the trying to understand and asking questions and gathering information on who you should and shouldn't partner with. The ability to walk away from a deal is coming from a position of power, not defeat. So do not feel like a loser if a deal doesn't work out, if you're not able to make one. A, that's a win-win solution. Try to reframe in your mind a failed deal as a win in terms of you avoiding future unnecessary losses. My personal belief is that many people come in knowing the solutions and trying to fix it by doing the work for them and ourselves. These are empath problems. <laughs> we so badly want to heal, fix, and resolve. And then either way, when it fails, we wonder why. Well, here's why. Number one, they didn't have any skin in on the game. Number two, you never gave them an opportunity to demonstrate empathy or not, which is very telling. This is key information you want to know in the negotiations. You want to know then and there. Do they care about what's in it for you or not? You don't want to be in an agreement with who, someone who doesn't give a flip about whether or not you win or lose. Thirdly, they're put off by you presuming to know what's best for them without checking in first. And fourth, it cheats them out of relational work. It cheats you out of having a relationship with someone who is willing to do the work. Codependents are often too insecure to, you know, do this intel gathering, pay attention to the red flags, walk away, have an exit strategy, take their losses sooner than later, um, because they're just, they're, they're too insecure to risk rejection, loss. So they end up compromising their core values. They do all the relationship work for two, and then they later resent it because they lose. And then they wonder why. Well, it all could have been seen in the negotiation stages when they should have realized this is not a deal I need to enter into. I'm never going to win with this person. The lesson here is that no amount of effort on your part will make up for another person's lack of it. You cannot do another person's spiritual growth for them or relationship work with for them you just can't thanks for watching if you want to see the next video in the series i'll have it here as soon as it's available in the meantime if you want more resources for empaths click here and remember i've got my book available on amazon and i appreciate all your likes shares subscribes comments down below thank you so much for your support